lot of black men have left the church who grew up in the church, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you found solace in the church later on in life. Why do you feel Christianity in America is not capturing the hearts of black men? Mm. Man, this is a layered answer, and I'm going to do my best, right? Because um, if anybody had the silver bullet, I think we would have addressed it in this way. There's a number of issues. Some of it we addressed. Because the church is a representation of something, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the church is not so much the institution. The church is, is called the called out people of God. E Ecclesia is the, the Greek translation. It's a people, and a people is like operating like an organism, which represents the, the entire family of God, right? It's a body. They literally use the word body. And ultimately, the church, the, these gathering ground, what's become an institution, is a place where locally all those people come together to encourage and help each other, right? Stay strong in their faith and also be sent to care for those around them. It's a family. It's a representation of a family. It's a representation of God. In our community, one element is the dynamic of what's happened to our families. Because again, it, a family, home, marriage, home, family is a training ground, right? We always say your relationship with God affects your relationship with people. Your relationship with God affects your relationship with your father. Your relationship with your father affects how you see God. Often, I always felt like, God, are you, are you not pleased with me? Are you not? I was always trying to impress because I wanted my dad to be pleased with me. Unconsciously, I didn't realize even when I thought about God, even before I got deep, that often I do things and I think about God as in like, is he happy? Is he not happy? Like, it's this dynamic woman, sister, her relationship with her father affects her relationship with her husband. It's this pass down from father, parent, child, child, parent, this. It affects all of our relationships. So you have a dynamic often in churches where there's an authority figure, right, of someone that you're called to trust, to receive, to listen to. If you're not necessarily coming from by, I'm giving generalizations. It's harder to receive that when that training ground wasn't a safe place in the way it was supposed to be. God, your father is a representation of God. This, like who do you, who are you? This guy got his issues too. Who are you talking about? And he's asking for money. Or is this? It's one. So that's general. So a lot of brothers, there's a resistance because the figure of leadership in that context is somebody that I don't necessarily relate to or trust in home, which is a training ground for everything else in the world. That's one. I think two, we've also seen the fallen nature of it too. Because many brothers in, at least I'm talking about the West, because if you talk about the church, globally, globally, missionaries are being sent here. <laughs> That's why it was clearly America. Exactly, America. So you understand, so many brothers were stripped of their dignity and manhood in our community. One of the few places, particularly in the West, for men to affirm who they were was the church where they were now respected or they had authority. You've seen that in a healthy way. You've also seen it in unhealthy ways, where they reduplicate. Sometimes you'll see the, even the, the, the posts, the posts they seem like club flyers. I'm like, who is this? You know, or I am the man now, so now my humanity is showing up in my ministry, that I'm using this to purport. And so whether people see the view of this person is doing much better than them, I now, whatever I can get my hand on to affirm that I'm a man, even if it's the church and it's the pulpit, I will do it. And so now you have that resentment. And so there's a suspicion about, I'm not sure you're rocking with that. Number three, because of that absence, you only affirm and replicate what you have. So now they're predominantly women. What you have sometimes in a dynamic that many brothers express, whether publicly or silently because they can't, is that often the church seems more attuned to to the black women's ear than it is for brothers. I, I tip my hat, right, because I think, um, I think, I believe in common grace. Common grace is the idea that Christians don't hold the key to all wisdom. I believe God holds the key to all wisdom, but God does amazing things through everybody, 
whether they believe in him or not. God, but I believe God is the cause of it. That's general revelation. I think, for example, like you see the, who's done this very, very well in terms of affirming the man and speaking to the, the felt reality very effectively, you'll see even in the Nation of Islam. You know, whether you had Fruit of Islam and how they trained up men. Of the, they've done a good job, and that was during the time even Malcolm was on the block in Harlem. They're speaking to the felt day-to-day -day reality, and so for many brothers, they feel like what you're speaking about seems disconnected from my day-to-day -day reality. I do not see other brothers, and again, brothers like are driven by, oh, are there other brothers I respect? Or are you other brothers that are telling the truth? Uh, I give this context, we were talking about sports before. The coaching, I believe because of how we're designed, I think brothers often, even socially, are step into rejection a lot more often than our sisters. Not saying they don't have rejection. What I'm saying is that if you're the pursuer, you're most likely rejected more, right? And I think, sometimes I think, though we all are dealing with difficulty, I think the statistics, you can't argue with how brothers are suffering more in jail, more suicide, more things, die sooner. <laughs> like it's, har it's harsh. I think we could t deal with tough coaching a lot more easily than I think sisters could deal with tough coaching. I think brothers are tuned to that. There's a certain type of teaching that we can handle. Some brothers can listen. They can listen to Minnesota American. Because or they can listen to TD. But they can listen to them because they speak, because what they, they, Dr. Miles Monroe used to talk about this, um, uh, A.R. Bernard talked about it, it's like fathering. Great pastoring is fathering. They speak like fathers, and they're not afraid to tell the truth. A lot of brothers have been turned off by what they call it pandering, because brother's not there. It feels like you're not telling the full truth, and the only time you tell the truth is to beat up on us. But you don't necessarily hold the sisters accountable. You don't do this. and so. It seems like brothers are like, number one, are you speaking to my lived reality? How is this practical for me? If I can't have a job, what are we talking about? You know what I'm saying? What are we talking about? How are you helping me to be a better person, right? The gospel does do that. And so I, I believe that the church does have them. Number two, there's a way that I could receive. And I think you'll see the churches, there's been a number of books written about this. Churches that are often tailored to men have no issues of balance, but churches that they feel tailored to women do. And, and I think a lot of people are gonna be very defensive about what I'm saying, because it's almost like if you're in a house, you're there, you don't know how your house smells until somebody else comes in it. And I think there's the dynamic of being able to see, and I'm like, wow, I didn't realize even the, the, the examples that we're using, even the references that we're using, it seems tailored to a woman's ear. Well, it makes sense because if it's 80% or 70% women, and they're the ones who are supporting, they're the ones volunteering, then I'm gonna be particularly attuned to making sure what I'm saying works with them. And, hey, you know, I heard a lot of, I haven't been to church since God knows when, but I heard a lot of conversations and what I noticed is that from an economic standpoint, bro, you gotta mm -hmm. uh, cater to your clientele, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And like, I noticed pastors that, I remember I went to a, uh, Baptism. This was about ten years ago. I forgot one, one boomy place in Maryland, and I was really impressed with the pastor. Tell you the truth, bro, mm -hmm. I really was. Like he was really breaking down in regards to like healthy eating and, and preaching accountability, but the place was empty, right? And me and my brother always had this conversation. Like a pastor may start off where he is giving a message that would be appealing to a man, but can he keep the congregation full with that message? The yeah. majority, even men. We know there's a certain amount of men that don't want to hear that either. Yeah. Like, so they're kind of put in a place where it's like, you start off with this fire, but then it has to get diluted to keep the seats filled. And that's the, that, that's the, the, the pushback, because I want to be very clear, especially, you know, these things, we, we eclipse and whatnot. I think um, there are churches that are doing this well. And I do believe if you do it faithfully and do it well, Eric Bernard, there, there was a New York Times article in the 80s, and I, he had, at one time, it was like 70% men, black men, Brooklyn. There was, you no seen anything like it, similar to TD. You, you don't see, because they, they were faithful in that. And ultimately, they, they were, they're tied into the felt need. Brothers need structure. It, it was structured. Like, again, these are things where anyone who doesn't understand the nuance would be like, it doesn't mean this is the only structure. No, it's, it's, it's very unique. And also, at the end of the day, it's almost like you follow someone. This is when many people see the Instagram. We're drawn to somebody we want to be more like. I remember when I saw this man, like I remember going to um, um, CCC and stopping by visiting the 
first time in like 2007 in Brooklyn, in Flatlands Avenue. And he reminded me, it's like, it's like my father. He was not just the suit that booted, it was the fact that he was like, he was a smooth guy. Like he seemed, he, he seemed smart, attractive, sharp as a knife. Brothers want to, it's like brothers, we are made for mentorship. We want to be around or we want to learn from somebody we wouldn't mind being more like. And so if somebody doesn't see some there, themselves in that person, then they're more, less likely to follow them. I'm not going to follow you. Where are you going to lead me to? I saw them. I was my dad. I was just like, yeah. My, like, and so I, I received from how he was breaking stuff down. I was just like, if I, I, I wouldn't mind rocking with this cat. Brothers need to see that. Now, here's the thing. This is why we say it's nuanced. To your point, not everybody can receive that because you're part of your, you being prepared to hear a fathering voice is being fathered. Right? So certain people, like we talked about recruiting, they, can't, they won't go to certain coaches because those coaches coach is hard. And they want to go to the one who dotes on them or stuff because it's more like mama love. Right? Versus daddy's love is often, it's, more, it's, more, it's, it's difficult. Not saying that it doesn't have to be. What I'm saying is that it includes that. Right? He chastens, the Lord chastens those he loves, he says. And so I say that to say, like, there are examples of those who do it well. Right? I think there are... There are their generational gifts to our community, right? Um, and that's why I shout out Eric Bernard, I shout out T. Jakes, I shout out uh, uh, Tone, Dr. Tony Evans, Dr. Miles Monroe, that he brothers, sisters, everyone loved, not everybody, but like they appreciated, but had men. And I do think there's something to being a congregation or being a gospel that men could respond to. I think it starts with number one, you being a man that it could respond to, meaning that you're a man who actually submitted to God that you actually really live that life. And then ultimately, like, you show that you genuinely care about men and that you actually give an attention to men. Because the truth is, man, you know, women and kids, right? You know, it's the Chris Rock joint. You know what I'm saying? Where it's kind of like crying women and kids. The, the society only, and, and even, even so that our, our sister, even the most literal, will often push back against this because it's, it's, like a, it's almost like a survivor's remorse. The reality is it's like no one is going to care for brothers the way they would have uh, empathy for sisters and kids, women and children. And so brothers, at some point, it's an opportunity, is what I want to leave with and would hope, is that I talk about mental health. The reality is brothers know whether people in society, whether our sisters will admit it or not, no one gives a dang, man. Yes, philosophically, we do. <laughs> but empathy, we come, we're last in line on the empathy front structure either whether it's just black men in Western society, even in our community. And so I think because of that, it's an opportunity to be the one place, the church is supposed to be the hospital, man. The one place to say, even though the world is telling me I'm not worth nothing or that I'm not valued or that I'm not prioritized, you can tell me that. And then churches which prioritize, like you are a leader, you were made to be that. Don't care what they say, you come here, you serve. You have a place, I think that's the opportunity. The church is a place that you could help Make men, make disciples. That's what I said the nation of Islam got right. If you even see A.R. Bernard, he had a men's ministry. Man, he had that place structured you think is FOI. The security, all that? Brothers. The people who show up armor? Brothers. And men need structure, bro. Brothers need structure. That's what I'm saying. Like, even the spiritual gym, it's not a spiritual gym. The concept, you know, and I'm putting this, uh, this is the, the work even that I was on Dallas to doing. It's like a new, a new church model. The model is like, you not only have the fellowship area, where people could break bread and have dinner and meet for meals, like it's the new dining hall for adults. You have a co-working area, and then you have a gym, a wellness center. And literally, all under the same roof. And you do that all there. But then you're, you coming in to the church, we're not just asking you to just know how to learn scripture. You need to be well in your life. That's part of worship. Working out is worship. How you treat your relationships is worship. How you uh, uh, have your relationship with God is worship. So then this brother gets a holistic picture that actually helps him to say, yo, here's your, here's your, here's your God. We're going to work on this spiritually. We're going to work on this relationally. Your marriage is struggling. We're going to help you out in that counseling. So these things are all exist, but people don't see it within the context of their faith walk. That's your faith, right? It says like, man, dear guys, I pray that you're, you're doing well and that you're in, good, you're in good health, even as your soul prospers. That's a scripture. He's just like, I pray that you're in good health, even as your soul prospers. What he's saying is that your physical health in my heart, when I think about you, is just as important as your spiritual health. And so when brothers say, not just be in shape, but the fact that I'm valued, the fact that relationally you're looking out for me, 
Brothers need to have that. And so I think that's an actual opportunity. And so I'm excited to be a part of the generation of brothers who kind of like, no, no, no. We get that. But I think brothers now are realizing like, okay, we're now more open to their health. They're recognizing that what they've done thus far, to your point, achievements, oh shoot, somebody ate my food. <laughs> and then lastly, I think they're getting to this point where I think brothers are like, yo, I think we're, we need to prioritize brothers because they're the leaders. Hey, before you leave, I just got to tell you two things. One thing is you spoke earlier about um, people leaving the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And when people leave the neighborhood, that examples of men that they would interact with is not there. I think that's that access. I think information is so segregated and examples is segregated. Mm-hmm. When we talk about segregation, we mostly talk about economics. We don't talk about examples. Mm. That solid dude that you would see don't live there no more, bro. Right? Yeah. Another thing I want to add it on, I just want you to delve in more in regards to uh, because men are com- becoming very feminine, not necessarily like homosexual, but in mm-hmm. regards to their ability to take information a certain way. Mm-hmm. It's a burden on society, but it also seems to be a burden with the church. It like it, it affects. It's like the education system, bro. Like people try to separate it from the ecosystem of society, and what's going on there is affecting every institution. Mm. Mm. So what you were saying earlier in regards to you have men that can't. There, you know, I, I'm pretty sure you experienced this. Many men probably feel like intimidated by, it, or you can just see they just feel uncomfortable. They're not used to being around a real man. Yeah, and yeah. I can see how now that can hurt the church so much because if you have a pastor who's a real man, why would you you'd be thrown off to it in a sense? Yeah, man, bro, man. I mean, the most real I can say, man, it, it breaks my heart, man. But it also gives me I'm like very compassionate for it because that child didn't choose, man, like how they came up, and you're, it's foreign, right? To your point, more I said, like I never had my grandparents in older age. I don't know what I'm missing. I don't know what that dynamic is like. And so if you've been only attuned to a certain voice, you know, the first time, you know, you hear about that child that didn't hear and then they put the earpiece in and their eyes light up because it's the first time they heard sound. For some people, they're hearing that sound for the first time and it's very foreign. And it's like, you think it's a whisper, but they're hearing it as thunder. And so I think the reality for brothers, especially when you're taught that love is the way a woman delivers love and that love cannot be correction. Love cannot be um, rebuke. Love is only affirmation. I think, and I'm saying this to say, anyone, it's like having just one a wrench, and like sometimes you need a Phillips head. You, like, you, don't, you don't have one wrench, you're limited in your use. Both together, you're able to now be the, the, the person you were designed to be. And so the disproportionately, people, we hate, we, we, just, we really hate the statistics of it. There's, we're out of balance. We're a community out of balance. So most brothers and sisters only hear that voice and they believe that that's the reality and that's what's right. So now when they hear that, it makes them uncomfortable. They feel resistant. And also another part of this brother man that I think is really uncomfortable, but I, that's why I'm real casual, compassionate for, a lot of the time it comes from abandonment and rejection. Hey, what I learned is um, when I started teaching, right, the young ladies used to give me the hardest time in high school. But what I learned is that, uh, first of all, a lot of them never had a male black teacher, and they definitely never had a strong male teacher. Because mm-hmm. a lot of male teachers in there, they, they act like women in a sense of catering to mm-hmm. them. There's mm-hmm. no accountability. But what i come to learn is that, one, this is the first time being held accountable by a man. Mm-hmm. They saw it as abuse, bro. Yep. They didn't see it as love. They literally saw it as because love for them is happiness everything is okay there's no there's no correction there's no accountability but when i hold when you hold someone accountable and you actually want them to do better it's almost as viewed to them as being abusive brother it, this is why i keep uh, and this is why i always want to be holistic and clear and comprehensive what i'm saying right you need both and there's a there's the, there's a scripture god says it's like fathers be careful not to exasperate your children the exasperation is because he's like i know what i put in you so you can have a tendency to go <laughs> to be too much. And like there's a perfect, da- it's a harmony when you have the affirmation. The masculine and feminine. Exactly. You have that, that. Exactly. And there's a such thing as that, right? Even though society will tell you it's not. And so to your point, you're right. That's foreign, right? It's like somebody who's never been loved well. Like they'll sabotage that joint. 
because all they've known is the, the trauma, the drama. They're like, this don't sound right, this don't feel right. What are, you, what are you saying to me? Oh, you know, we ain't arguing, so you don't love me? It's just like, that's because that's what they, that's the language of love they've learned. That's been imprinted in them. And so now if somebody's not, oh, he's not trying this, or he ain't fighting for me, because I, I'm not gonna yell at you. I'm not going to, and, and vice versa, right? You know, and seeing that. I remember realizing, I'm like, yo, Nigerians were very like, I think he, he, Jamaican, I think we're very like confrontational. Animated. Animated and confrontational. People are like, why are you yelling? I'm not yelling, <laughs> right? But again, it took me kind of now being out of my environment of what's normal to realize that, okay, maybe I have to modulate this because this doesn't work. I think, number one, we have to also recognize that like, it's, it's, it's jarring. This was their entire life, their formative time when they put that, their formative time. And that's what's, you know, uh, fallenness and unbounded, meaning that you can't contain, we talked about like a vase breaking, you can't, con you don't know how many shards and different pieces gonna break into. That's what happens in a world that's, that's, that's not the way God designed it to be. Is that like literally from like Genesis 3, Genesis 4, like you have Cain and Abel. <laughs> like, it just gets worse and worse and worse. You're like, golly, man, yo, we need a savior, bro. Like it builds up to Jesus coming. Like it's so bad. It gets worse and worse and worse because humans being humans is not good, right? Similarly, you have this dynamic of like what, you know, you see how unbounded it is. The level of like damage that's done. But you're hopeful, right? Because to your point, some people will get it. You know, there's a, a story of like dropping like seed on hard ground, on rock, and some is fertile soil, good soil, where the seed will take in the wisdom. There were some people that you probably taught that like it was hard, but sometimes they, some of them, they got it. Some of them, it may not be you, but it'll be the teacher number four male that will break through. But your work helped break the, <laughs> the ground, right? And so I, I say, I think to your point, uh, it's important. I think less, the rejection piece, I think, is keen. And I want to say this to brothers or all of us, I think, especially if you felt consciously, and this is if somebody went to therapy and has the terms, if you felt rejected. So let's say, for example, you don't show up in a typical masculine way. Right? Typical masculine, everybody, I think, would understand what I'm saying, which is like, you know, if you, if you show off, you show a little bit more feminine, and you felt that your father was not proud of you was not pleased with you, was like almost like it seemed like he wasn't happy. And so you never lived up to, you never got that, this is my son, I'm really proud of him because I'm not like him. That internal resentment towards that traditional thing is, is called like, um, it's transferring. Like I'm transferring that resentment or that feeling of rejection from that one or whether he wasn't there and he just was not there and you didn't think he didn't want you. I'm not transferring to all the male relationships. So all of them that show up like that, whether I'm conscious of it or not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that rejection, so I resent or I don't like. And so I'm only gonna sit in spaces that affirm. And here's the thing, right? Uh, I have a view about our highest identity. And I say this to brothers, I say this to sisters, I think whether you're a brother and you've had to navigate this and have gone through that and have felt rejected, I've done that, is that your highest identity is far beyond your sexuality. Your highest identity is who you belong to. No matter what you do, you are, that you are that man's child. You are the most highest child. And that that's the identity that, the war that gives you your value more than anything else. And I think that's also a first step to actually being able to heal, right? Because often they're giving you the best of what they know, right? And even sometimes it's the fear of that. And also number two is saying at the end of the day, what we talked about before, full circle. I can go out to seek value but that ultimately is not my value. So even if my parent is imperfect, I could still be valuable and I could still show up even though he may not give me what I desire. That's like people who come to the stage of saying like, can I still move forward even if I don't get an apology? It's like, you know what? I'm coming full. That's where the faith thinks. I'm coming full where I've been forgiven. I could forgive them too. And ultimately I don't need him even though I desire it and it hurts because I do have a heavenly father who endows me with something that no one could take away or validate. That for many people is usually sometimes where they come to the knees and say, you know what, this faith thing's for me because I'm, if I keep waiting, it's gonna kill me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so yeah, I, I, say, I say this, I'm saying this with compassion, really understanding what uh, brothers are going through. I've been fortunate 
to have an amazing father. Um, but I can only imagine what it feels like to not have it. And so I just pray to the brothers, man, I, 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 my heart is heavy, but it's not the end of the story. And as accountability, you, ha you can make a choice every day to heal. And I think it starts with you, most importantly, recognize you do have that power and you can experience healing. So that's my hope. Thank you.